and welcome. Um, we are speaking with Kevin Walker, who is the CEO of the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation. Good evening, Kevin. Again, welcome to the program. We're glad uh, not only that you're with us tonight and being able to talk to a bunch of folks interested in the Battle of Newmarket, but also I want to make sure I thank you again for uh, taking me around on the battlefield on a hot day several months ago and uh, to help get some pictures and, and also sending us illustrations and maps. So thank you and welcome. John, thank you for having me. It was great having you here in Newmarket. I wish we could have all your guests out here on the battlefield with us. It was a really great day. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be here and be a part of your program. Great, thank you so much. So uh, folks in the audience, uh, Kevin is uh, with the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation. Uh, before that, he was a, a ranger at Antietam Battlefield. He's been a battlefield tour guide. He uh, is a, um, a longtime student of the of the uh, of the Shenandoah Valley in the Civil War, and, and now gets the enviable job of living in the Shenandoah Valley uh, and also interpreting the battlefields and trying to save as much land as possible. So, with that, um, Kenna, uh, why don't you pull up the uh, first slide because we want to welcome. We want to make sure we. Uh, talk about the Shenandoah Val Valley Battlefield Foundation. Kevin, what is what is the foundation, and um, what what do you what are you attempting to do as far as uh, uh, saving battlefield land? Well, the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation was established by Congress in 1996 to manage the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields National Historic District, and this historic district was uh, created to protect and preserve. The Civil War sites, um, uh, the battlefields, and the history of the Civil War here in the Shenandoah Valley. Now, the Shenandoah Valley was a really, really important place during the war, uh, and you can tell a lot of the entire story of the Civil War by using the uh, valley as a microcosm to illustrate that. And Congress knew that, and they created the district, and we've been here ever since, uh, preserving battlefield ground, opening it as battlefield parks, um, and uh, doing what we can to preserve uh, Civil War history. We have uh, over 7,000 acres that have been protected by the by the National Historic District uh, here in the Valley, and we're, we've got uh, thousands of those acres open as Battlefield Park, and we're doing more and more every day. I know you're a busy guy because uh, you're hard to get in touch with, uh, but you got a lot to do over there. you got a good staff over there. You run a lot of great programs, so uh, we're glad you're part of the scene over there, a big part of it. And when we're talking about the, uh, the your your region of preservation and interpretation and tours and programming, we're talking about from basically Winchester all the way down to Stanton and, and over to McDowell and Highland County, and it's it's quite it's quite a, a quite a reach. It's eight counties in Virginia. It's the entire Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. It uh, goes from the West Virginia Virginia line on the northern end of the district all the way to about twenty miles south of Stanton along the I-81 corridor. And it takes in, like you said, Highland County as well as Page County, a little farther off of 81. Kind of put that in perspective, it's about 25% of the land mass of Virginia uh, and three times the size of Rhode Island. So it's not an insignificant area. During the war, this was kind of the Gaza Strip of the Civil War. Something, uh, a battle and an engagement or a skirmish is happening in the Shenandoah Valley uh, once every three to four days for four years. So it was a constant conflict and uh, would have been a very horrible place to be uh, for those four years. Before we get into uh, the belligerence of the new market campaign, uh, the, I just also want to thank Savas Beatty Publishing Company uh, for allowing us to use some of the maps in their publications. Uh, Call Out the Cadets is uh, one of the titles they have. And, and Valley Thunder is another. They have two fine publications on, on this campaign. So thanks to Ted Savas and Savas Beatty Publishing. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Um, uh, Kenna, the, um, we're gonna go to the next one here. Uh, this was really a matchup between two generals of, of unequal quality. And uh, on, the, on the right, we have uh, the Confederate commander, uh, General Major General John C. Breckinridge, uh, former vice president of the United States. Um, he was, had a military experience and he was against the Union commander, which was uh, General Franz Siegel, who did have military experience in the German revolutions of 1848 
uh, uh, he was on the losing side of those, decided to move to the United States. And as a German, a very important uh, to, to, to uh, recruiting efforts uh, to get German troops, uh, German people of German descent, recent immigrants to America to help support the union cause. And Kevin, there were, it seems like what reading about the Battle of Newmark, it seems like there were a lot of German officers in the valley. Is that what you find? Yeah, there, re there really were. In fact, there were a lot of immigrant officers uh, uh, from different places in the Union Army uh, throughout the war. Uh, the German population in the United States was a major segment of the population and a major voting block. And things were not any different then than they are now when it comes to politics. Abraham Lincoln in 1864 is in the middle of a reelection campaign um, and appointing a German commander, one who is popular among German voters, um, was as much a political move as it was a military one. Um, and so you, you see some of the commanders here that do very, very well. Uh, Augustus Moore uh, was a, uh, owned a bar in Ohio before he came here, German officer, uh, does exceedingly well, and others don't do as well. But uh, a lot of them were political appointments to keep the German population happy. So uh, in 1864, uh, General uh, Ulysses Grant comes in, promoted a three-star general, and uh, he has a plan for Virginia, which is basically a multi-prong uh, movement in the spring of 1864, where his campaign, of course, would be the, would be the, the bulk of it and later resulted in, in battles of the wilderness, Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, and, and eventually down toward Petersburg. Uh, a second prong uh, of the assault would be under Major General Ben Butler in the Bermuda 100 area, which is near Petersburg, to try to take Richmond from kind of the backdoor approach. And then this third uh, route, which was to have a Union force in the northern Shenandoah Valley uh, and, and along the Potomac River even, to consolidate uh, under G General Siegel and to move south. So what, can you tell us a little bit about what was Siegel's objective? Absolutely. You know, uh, I, think, I think it was Grant who said something to Lincoln to the effect that if Siegel can't do the skinning, he can hold the leg while somebody else does the skinning. And that's what's going to happen here in Virginia. What Grant wants to do is make sure that he puts all of his forces on the move uh, at one time so that, so that Lee cannot um, maneuver his forces in such a way to uh, maximize uh, the effect of his small numbers by meeting one threat and then shifting his men to meet another. If, if Grant puts all of his men in motion at once, it will force Lee to have to respond in many directions at one time spreading out um, spreading out Lee's forces and capitalizing on Grant's numerical advantage. So that's kind of the overall thought. It actually is very brilliant. Um, what Siegel's job is, Siegel is going to command all of the Union forces out in uh, the Department of West Virginia. Uh, and so he's got a lot of Ohio troops. He has a lot of uh, West Virginia troops. He's got Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, um, some Connecticut troops, and so on. And they are um, have been heretofore, for the most part, guarding the b &O Railroad. Uh, and what Grant wants to do is he wants to put them on the move. Uh, there is a force under George Crook who is going to come out of the central part of West Virginia, and they're going to strike south by southeast to try and cut the railroad uh, line uh, down near Salem, Virginia, and then turn to the north and head towards Stanton. Uh, Stanton being directly uh, astride the rail line that leads into Richmond. So that, that was what Crook's uh, objective was. Siegel was going to take another portion of that force and come from the north up the Shenandoah Valley, moving towards Stanton as well. His objective was a little different, and we often forget about that when we're talking about the Battle of Newmarket. He wasn't supposed to seek out and destroy a Confederate army. His job was to draw... Confederate forces draw Breckinridge away from Stanton to get Breckinridge, who's the Confederate commander, he's in command of all the Confederate forces in southwestern Virginia, to get him to move his forces out of southwestern Virginia and get them to go down the valley, uh, move further north, which would allow Crook to come in from behind and, and seize Stanton. 
So that was the original plan. And that's kind of where the stage is set as we begin this whole talk. Okay, good. So we have Siegel coming up the valley, which means moving south. And here we have uh, a, a part of the valley. This, I don't know if it's exactly half half of half of the valley, but we have the upper, uh, excuse me, the northern northern part of the valley. Uh, the the it's not marked as well in this map. We have a lot more maps coming up, but we have uh, the road on the left is the Valley Pike, which is basically U.S. 11 today. And you can see Strasburg, uh, Winchester's off to the north, and you can see the route that that Siegel uh, eventually took down uh, south along the Valley Pike through Woodstock uh, and Mount Jackson. Really, kind of got to Mount Jackson, and, and, and in, so, in some ways, uh, he was expecting to uh, to make a defensive position there. Of course, it, it wound up uh, being at Newmarket instead, several miles south. And off to the right of the picture, the road that cuts through the mountains there is the New Market, uh, New Market Gap. And uh, we will um, we'll be able to see that in a photo here. So uh, let's have our next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about the armies. These are approximate numbers. Confederate Army, about 4,000 at the battle. The Union Army, about 6,200. And uh, briefly, Kevin, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the configuration of these two forces? And in some ways, they were kind of patched together uh, uh, mini armies that kind of coalesced for this campaign, and not all of them had served together before. That, that's absolutely correct. Now, let's take the Union Army first. Uh, the Union Army uh, was relatively well organized, but the duty that they had uh, been posted to uh, previous to this had them fighting in, in, in small unit sizes. And when I say fighting, maybe a better word is guarding or serving. Um, um, many of them had not fought extensively here T4. Some of them had, uh, but uh, the vast majority of that army had been doing guard duty along the B&O Railroad, uh, guarding bridges, uh, mountain passes, that type of thing. And uh, they had not really functioned even as full regiments, let alone as uh, battalions or brigades or or so on uh, in an army uh, that was going to be in the field. So that's going to be a difficult thing for the for the Union forces as as um, as Seagulls bringing these uh, men together from far flung postings throughout the mountains, what's now West Virginia. Um, the the men under Crook are going to be a relatively unified fighting force, but they're going to be facing um, you know some terrain in the mountains and some weather issues and and other things, um, and they're not going to really they're not going to figure into the direct story of the battle action here at, um, at, at Newmarket. Now, the Confederate Army is a lot more ragtag. Um, Breckenridge has to create it uh, out of whole cloth. He's going to have Eccles Brigade, which is going to come from uh, Camp Dolly. They're going to march um, in a, a very far distance uh, over Arger's terrain to get to Stanton. They're coming out of the mountains of West Virginia. Uh, and then you're going to have um, you're going to have Wharton's uh, brigade, which is going to come out of southwestern Virginia. And you, know, of course, you're going to have the VMI cadets in reserve. You're going to have um, uh, in Bowdoin's uh, Confederate cavalry. I use cavalry loosely. It's it's partially mounted, partially dismounted uh, force. It's been holding the valley about 1,400 uh, men. And so Breckenridge is really on the fly and on the march, having to bring that entire army together and create a cohesive fighting force. Um, the difference being a lot of his men are veterans, obviously not the VMI cadets. Although um, we often think that this is the first time the VMI cadets have been called out to, to serve in the Confederate Army. That is not the case at all. Uh, they had been called out before, they've just never been in battle before. Um, so anyway, that's that's a little bit about the, the composition of the armies. Uh, both, are, both armies are facing some logistical and organizational um, challenges as they move towards the battlefront. I think one more factor we should probably mention is that when Breckenridge took command, uh, that was regarded by Confederates in the Valley and all over the place as, as a, a great thing uh, that, that he was appointed. He was well known. He looked like a soldier. Uh, the, the troops were impressed by him and he had experience. Whereas uh, uh, Siegel, not popular among fellow officers, 
he was really not uh, somebody who would increase the morale of the army. And quite frankly, as, as, he, as he marched down toward Newmarket, um, or aiming for Stanton, uh, his, his troops seemed to be strung out along the Valley Pike for you know, a dozen or 20 miles, something along those lines. So it was quite a difference in, in leadership as well. It is. Um, and, uh, you know, Breckenridge is every bit the soldier. He's one of the most famous men in the United States at the time of the war. He had been vice president of the United States. He had a run for president against Abraham Lincoln. Um, and so he's, uh, he, he definitely creates Elan and esprit de corps among his men. Uh, and Siegel's temperamental. He's German. Uh, he, he's pretty cliquish with his German officers. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot about this campaign that um, I don't know that, that Siegel does well, um, but it's just not well enough. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to the next slide so we can get into the nitty gritty a little bit more. Um, we've got a, a map here uh, that shows a little bit more narrow focus uh, at uh, where, where I have the red A is Mount Jackson. Uh, at, one, at one point, once the once Siegel started to get wind that there was a Confederate force moving toward him from the south. He seemed to aim toward that, toward uh, taking up a defensive position at Mount Jackson on, on, the, uh, on the Valley Pike. Uh, B is where Newmarket is located. Of course, that's where the battle actually took place on May 15th. And just to orient folks, the, uh, where the C is, that's Newmarket Gap, uh, that was a key uh, a way of getting from the western side of the valley over Massanutten Mountain into the uh, Page Valley, or sometimes called the Luray Valley. And um, uh, that was a key position to be able to move troops. Um, and I think that the next, with the next slide, we'll be able to see a little bit more of this. Um, so this is, uh, the, on the left, you see an image of the New Market Gap that's looking from the valley uh, on Shirley's Hill and um, near the town of New Market. And it's a very prominent uh, landmark even today um, that you can see from miles and miles away the gap. And I have it marked on the uh, 1864 map uh, from the, uh, one of the Hotchkiss maps from the Library of Congress. And the arrow there shows the uh, Siegel's Union Army advance southward toward Newmarket once mm. cavalry actions took place on the 13th and the 14th. It, it became pretty obvious by the late afternoon of the, uh, of the 14th that the action was going to be in and around Newmarket. Um, with the next slide, let's, let's talk, Kevin, about the, uh, what, we, what we've got here. So this, this is a view looking north from Shirley's Hill with Newmarket uh, over there on the right, uh, Manners Hill, which is where the Union, the initial Union position was. Unfortunately, I-81 run, running right down the middle of the battlefield. But what, what was, uh, this, Shirley's Hill was important in, in a place where the Confederates started to mobilize. What happened at this point on the morning of the 15th? So you're, you're um you're really looking over uh, the battlefield as it would have been viewed by Breckenridge and his staff uh, on the early morning of the 15th. Uh, by that time, you have uh, Siegel is in Woodstock uh, and he's moved forward to Mount Jackson. He's not on the battlefield yet. You have Augustus, Augustus Moore, who's commanding that lead element of federal troops that have formed a battle line running from basically where you see your arrow on the left of the screen, uh, all the way across the image uh, to uh, where you see the T in Newmarket. That was, that was basically the, um, the, the federal uh, defensive position that Breckenridge would have viewed almost exactly from the vantage point of this, this image. Um, what Breckenridge wanted to do is he wanted the federals to attack him. And there's a bunch of back and forth the evening of the 14th. There's actually two nighttime uh, assaults on the Union line by and Bowden's men who are, who are holding this position until Breckenridge's men come up in the early morning hours of the 15th. Uh, and those were ordered attacks. They were not um, organic attacks that, that sprung up along the line. Those were directed by the Confederate command 
to try and get the Federals to come out of their positions or to, to contemplate an attack the next morning. By the next morning, by the 15th, it's pouring down the rain, absolutely horrible weather. All of Breckenridge's men are up. That's not the case for Siegel. Siegel has been getting more and more spread out as he came further up the valley, coming further south. Uh, and he spread out on the morning of the battle as well. Why is he spread out? Um, you know, he's getting conflicting reports about Grant's success on the other side of the mountains. Uh, Grant has just fought the Battle of the Wilderness. He's not, um, he, he, he's getting reports that maybe Grant has been beaten. He can't get in, in touch, he's not been able to get in touch with Crook. He really doesn't know what's happening. To his credit, though, he feels that if Grant has been beaten and if Crook is in trouble, he needs to move even further south to get closer uh, to his objective and maybe closer to helping out Crook. So he's going to move to Mount Jackson, which is just immediately uh, north of this image in the direction of the viewer. Uh, and, um, and he's going to try and close up his men on Moore's position that I described here, uh, the one that's uh, here in this image. Uh, and when the battle begins, it's going to begin with an artillery duel. There'll be cannons on this position on Shirley's Hill looking down into the valley there. And there will be a pretty serious and significant artillery duel that'll last from about 8.30 or nine o'clock in the morning until noon. Uh, and it's going to be dramatic, a uh, tremendous amount of artillery fire, uh, and it's going to tear up the town. Uh, in fact, there are still artillery shells lodged inside of uh, at least one building uh, here in New Market uh, and another uh, on, uh, on VMI's property, so that there's two buildings. Um, and um, anyway, that's how the battle will begin. Okay, let's uh, move to the next slide as we follow the uh, course of action here. Now, it's uh, this is a um, a map showing the where the skirmish lines were, and kind of right before the the main action, the the heavy firing took place. Confederates down in the south, uh, at the bottom of this map, uh, Union troops uh, again, as as Kevin has mentioned. The uh, a lot of Sieg a significant number of troops of seagulls, including a few artillery batteries, are strung out all the way back uh, several miles from this uh, from from the uh, uh, seagulls location. <clears throat> so uh, interestingly, uh, what what develops here is seagull was basically on the offensive, moving south from Winchester Strasburg to try to get to Stanton. But when he gets to Newmarket, he adopts a defensive strategy uh, for the battle itself. And, and it's, it's really Breckenridge that winds up saying, well, if he's not gonna, if he's not gonna come at me to fi fight a battle, I'm gonna go get him, uh, kind of paraphrasing there. But as you can see, the, there's a Union skirmish lines along the, to the west of the town of Newmarket. And, uh, one of the interesting things, uh, folks, that, that Kevin pointed out to me while we were touring this area is uh, the, the first half of the battle, first half of the day, really, um, was, was, a, was in the town and, and very close to the town, as you can see here. And um, <clears throat> the uh, Confederates had come off of Shirley's Hill. You can see Shirley's Hill there where the troops were, the Confederate troops, Union troops in and around Manors Hill. And they're going to be pushed back, uh, basically toward what's what's now the Bushong or the the um, the Newmarket Battlefield Park. Uh, we have a couple of pictures here, and Kevin, I'll get you to help me narrate these. Let's go to the next one uh, so we can see a little bit more. Uh, this map actually uh, is from the Battlefield Foundation. It includes the modern roadway here, just so you can gauge. Folks who have been down up and down 81 have seen Newmarket uh, uh, Battlefield on the on the west side, but quite a, quite a bit of the battle fought on the east side of I-81. And you get a better look here with the color map of the, the little dots there. The red dots are the, the Confederate skirmish line, the blue dots, the northern one. And uh, Kevin, tell us the significance of that Union line. They're all along this, this road here that goes from the north end of Newmarket, the town, over toward the river. What's the significance of that line? Now that, that's the old river road that runs there. It, it left the historic town of Newmarket. Uh, the road was probably 100 years old by the time of the Civil War, maybe a little less, but not much. Uh, and it was, uh, it was the road that linked 
uh, a, a, a ford on the Shenandoah River to the town itself and to the Valley Turnpike. It runs along uh, Mainers Hill and it is a pretty significant defensive position. And that's where Moore is gonna set up, as you can see in the map, the first West Virginia anchored in town, uh, the 123rd Ohio, uh, 18th Connecticut, and then uh, Wincoop's Cavalry are gonna be patrolling the Western end of that line. It's, it's a relatively strong position, um, but it is uh, not strong enough uh, for what Moore thinks is a much, much larger force uh, than actually what Breckenridge had. And Breckenridge, if you look at his position, he has laid out his line somewhat in echelon with overlapping uh, sections of a line that would give the impression when added to the rolling landscape that there may be several complete battle lines in succession there. Uh, and so there was a little bit of a ruse created by the way Breckenridge uses the terrain and arranges his troops. Um, and, uh, and so what you're going to see here as the infantry part of this fight gets started midday on the 15th is you're going to have Breckenridge's men sweeping off of Shirley's Hill and the heights south of town down into the town with the 30th Virginia leading the way as skirmishers. They're going to drive back the 18th Connecticut's uh, companies A and B skirmishers back against that, um, that river road line. And there's going to be a, a sharp action along the river road line before the Federals collapse back towards the, uh, the William Rice farm, Dr. Rice's farm. Uh, there's at least one eyewitness account of hand-to-hand -hand fighting uh, around St. Matthew's Church. You see that marked on the map. Um, and so this is not insignificant fighting, uh, and it's really going to kick the battle off in town, which is something that a lot of people, uh, because of I-81 and because uh, since the 1960s, there's been a small part of the battlefield that's been the interpretive area. A lot of times people forget that a lot of this fighting swirled around the buildings uh, and right down the streets. So Kevin, in this phase, we're talking about the, the as the, you can see from the map, that using using the Valley Pike, which folks, uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with this area, it's, it's on this map, it's, it's, it's called, route, it's shown as Route 11. But with artillery going off on, from both sides, uh, what, was, what, was the, what was the civilian experience inside the town? Can you tell us a little bit about this during this uh, sure. early phase of the battle? What, what was going on in the town? This was a Sunday morning. Uh, there had been fighting, as, as I mentioned before, the evening of the 14th. There had been a sharp action down along Smith's Creek uh, among some local forces, uh, skirmishing, fighting with, um, with some of Imboden's cavalry and uh, against uh, some, some federal troopers who were coming through the Newmarket Gap. So there had been a lot of military action over the last few days. So many of the residents were already in their cellars and taken refuge together in uh, more substantial homes. Um, and it was a quiet Sunday morning until the artillery un, uh, unleashed basically a, a hell on earth on the town. We do know from some of the residents in town that um, described the artillery as a, a saw going through a dry board, uh, the, 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 sound, um, the sound of that artillery as it ripped through the air. Um, we, we do know that the, some of the first casualties are going to be Union troops on the southern end of the town, and that they're going to be um, dragged down the streets with their blood, quote, leaving, uh, leaving streaks along the pavements. Um, it's going to be a pretty horrible scene for a lot of the civilians. Uh, but what's happening during the battle is going to, is going to pale for them uh, in comparison to the aftermath of the battle. So a couple images here that uh, we took. Um... From the one on the left, this this is this is the bottom of that kind of small creek valley uh, where the skirmishers were. The image on the left is from the Union position, looking out toward where the Confederate uh, advance was coming from, and that 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 hill in the back that's uh, wooded in the rear and has a has an open face, a grassy. Uh, grassy top to it. That's Shirley Hill that we were just talking about where the Confederates were coming over, up and over and down to right at where we're looking at here. Um, and on the right uh, is, is a little bit more of that line there. Um, Kevin, what's, 
what what's the what's the action that's going on here and is this where the the union troops first begin to retire back to river road this is the 18th connecticut's skirmish position basically uh they are advanced into this low ground where you see those parking lots in the near distance uh that was all pretty marshy uh there was a um a stable that sat there where you see the building on the far left, that whitish building with the great green roof. There's a labyrinth of fencing in the area. The fencing you see recreated there uh, is in the exact location that it was on the day of the battle. And so you have, um, you have this is right behind the main street buildings of New Market. Uh, and just like it is today, it was then. Uh, and this is where the 18th Connecticut is hunkered down that night, the first West Virginia is going to be advanced into this area as well there. Um, and there's going to be fighting here uh, on this ground the night of the 14th into the early morning hours of the 15th before everything settles down ahead of that um, that uh, artillery duel. Yeah. Probably one of my favorite stories here, John, is that uh, you've got those 18th Connecticut boys that are hunkered down among uh, 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 behind some fence rails uh, and they hear a commotion in front of them and they're, they're cocking their rifles there absolutely sure that it's going to be the, the charge that they've been waiting for. And uh, what comes bounding across the pike on the other side of these buildings and breaks through the fence is a stampede of cattle. And they're being chased by a Newfoundland dog. Uh, <laughs> and so that's how their battle begins. Very tense area, very miserable. Remember, it's pouring down the rain. They were not allowed to have fires the night before. Uh, and so this is a very tense area. And this is that area, remember, from the map before, in that low ground between Shirley's Hill and Maynard's Hill. This is the no man's land, if you will, in between the two lines. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Again, <coughs> this is a great, this is a, excuse me, this is a view looking south uh, from, in, in the town of Newmarket. And um, some of the, uh, 18, uh, the 19th century structures still there. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to see on this, Kevin, because of the distance, but uh, Breckenridge was in the town at some point uh, during this phase uh, trying to reconnoiter. What what was he doing in this area? Breckenridge is, is a, an amazingly active commander uh, throughout his career in the Civil War. Um, he's, he's brave to a fault. And at Newmarket, he's very near the very front line. I mean, he's personally... Um, much of the time placing the artillery. He'll stay with the artillery. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, but he's very close to the front line. So as the infantry troops move into Newmarket, he's right with them. And as they're pushing through the streets right in the area where you're, where you're uh, looking, they're, they're pushing in the direction of, of our view of the image. So they're coming out of the image towards the viewer. Uh, and, uh, and he's right behind them. When he comes into town, He's looking for a vantage point. Remember, it's raining, um, and he needs to see the federal position if he can. So as his men clear some of the streets, he knocks, starts knocking on doors, and uh, he comes to the Hinkle house. And Mrs. Hinkle answers the door um, and says that before her was standing one of the most handsome men she'd ever seen. And he asked if, uh, if, she could, if he could uh, go to her roof, if there was a way to get to the roof. And she said, yes, there is. There was a hatch in the attic. Um, and you can go to that hatch today. It's catty corner right here uh, out the window that I'm sitting in front of. And uh, he goes to the, to the roof and climbs out in the rain onto the roof and clamors against a, um, a chimney and leans against a chimney. And he will view the union positions from there, telling his aides you know, to push his men forward, push forward. Um, he will draw the attention of federal gunners uh, and he'll have to clamber down out of there very quickly as a uh, shot and shell comes in his direction. Uh, so there's some great stories like that, great interactions. Um, uh, Mrs. Hinkle, uh, his great, great grandson, um, lives here in Newmarket and, uh, and owns that house today. Hmm. Well, uh, thanks to the foundation, we have a great photo on uh, the next slide, which uh, shows the vantage point, roughly the same vantage point uh, from a picture taken a couple of years before the war, Kevin, is that right? Yes, this is, uh, if you flip back to the previous slide, John, um, um, if we can. There you go. If you can see in the distance, there's a traffic light. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go now, go back to the historic image, 
that's the intersection at the traffic light. Got it. And so Got you're it. you're continuing to look south. You see the cyber house sign. Uh, if you look along that street, there is a, a rather prominent lighter colored facade. That's the Hinkle House. That's where that took place. And right. the building, the prominent building on the left, which sits right at the corner of the intersection, that's the building I'm sitting uh, in right now. Great shot. Uh, appreciate you sending that to us to use here. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and keep following the battle here. So we uh, this uh, this particular stage, this is, you can see the Confederates now on the river road, that, that line there you see in the middle, uh, Union troops uh, being pushed back toward the Bushong farm. And in this area, once you get to the Bushong farm, uh, very open uh, fields, farming fields, uh, uh, good for artillery fire, and also to some extent some cavalry uh, as well. And this is the beginning of, of what would become a very interesting decision on the part of, uh, of Stahl. And those are two cavalry troops, uh, two, two cavalry units, Winecoop and Tibbets on the right there you can see. But uh, you can also see next to St. Matthew's Church is the, uh, is, is the guns from the VMI battery and two other batteries. And that's, that's where Breckenridge was keeping them even with the lines on the right flank to try to make maximum use of, of that artillery, which uh, he did to great effect. We've got some, we got, got a couple images here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is along the river road. Um, the river road is to the right, and that is the location of St. Matthew's Church, although that's not the original church, right, Kevin? That's right. The original church sat right in that area, but that, that is the same congregation. So this was the second line, and you mentioned hand-to-hand uh, -hand fighting uh, on the second line when the, when the two forces met right in this uh, cemetery. Can you go into just a little bit more detail on that? Sure. So if you, if you see the, um, the, the road is approximated by that fence that you see running through this image, and so the Federals are along this road facing to the right of this image, um, and they're going to break to the rear and go through the churchyard. Many of the headstones that you see there in the distance were there that day. Uh, and the Federals are, are going to be scrambling through this churchyard at the same time that the Confederates are overtaking them from the right of this image, again, moving towards the left. Um, this knoll is very prominent here. That is um, representative of that entire ridge line that the Old River Road runs along and gives you a sense of just why Moore felt that this was a good first position. It really is. It, you know, it, it really is a long slope to the, um, the, to the south through the town. This was a pretty commanding spot. It's going to drop off precipitously uh, very quickly uh, as you move further to the north as well, as you get into these rolling undulating hills that uh, John was referring to, which you know rises uh, up and then drops and rises again to uh, Bushong's Hill. Um, Siegel is now on the battlefield just before the Confederates reach this position uh, and drive his men away. Siegel arrives on the battlefield. He'll leave his staff at the Rice House, which is immediately north of this position to the left of your screen. Uh, he'll ride up to this point, almost exactly this point, and he'll ride this line. He'll quickly decide uh, that he wants to move the line back uh, he wants to, to shorten the distance between the troops that are coming up from Ma Mount Jackson. Uh, and he also wants to shorten uh, the, the battle lines. And he's going to use the, the, the pinching on the landscape that happens between uh, the Smith Creek and the, uh, the river, uh, the Shenandoah River, which kind of impinges on, on the east and west uh, of the battlefield to give him a shorter front that he has to defend. And so he is already contemplating moving his men back. Uh, so you might ask, why doesn't he reinforce this line as the Confederates are coming up? It's because he doesn't want this to be his line anyway. He wants these men to fall back anyway. Uh, and so it's going to create some confusion as Siegel arrives on the battlefield and tries to create his new defensive position farther north. Mm. OK, uh, let's move on to the next image that we have. Uh, this uh, shows what Kevin was just talking about, the, of, of the narrowing or pinching of the battlefield. You can see the North Fork of the Shenandoah River 
on the left. And if you've never been to this, uh, the uh, New Market Battlefield, uh, the battlefield, there's an overlook there. And you can see that that, that uh, you can tell by the contour lines, it's very steep, but it's, it's really a precipitous drop off at a cliff uh, basically in, in several sections in there. And then Smith's Creek, uh, much smaller th than the Shenandoah River, but uh, recent, the recent rains had really made it, made it very impassable in, in almost every spot. So uh, you can also see that Imboden, who's on the right, uh, the other side of Smith's Creek, has quite a position there. And we'll, we'll have an image of that in a second. Uh, it never really takes advantage of that, but uh, you can see that the, that the, on, the, on the kind of the, the lower left quadrant, uh, two black markings there for the barn and the house of the Bushong farm. And that's where the next line that the Virginians, uh, excuse me, the Confederates made. And um, one other thing before we move on, because we've got, a, we've got several images coming up of what's going on here. Uh, you can see that Stahl with, with uh, his cavalry there right on the Valley Pike makes a cavalry charge uh, that really doesn't make a lot of sense and really seems almost Napoleonic in a way. So Kevin, what's the background on this charge? Did he act alone? Was this Siegel's idea? And why did he charge infantry and artillery uh, uh, with only cavalry? It's a, uh, it's a little bit of a mystery. At this point, uh, Siegel is personally in command. He's riding his battle line. He's, he, you can see the 34th uh, Massachusetts there um, on the on their position on the battlefield. He's often somewhere up near there. You can see the 12th West Virginia. 12th West Virginia, at, at least part of this battle, is following Siegel around. Uh, they don't know where they're supposed to go, and they don't understand what he's saying. Uh, he's very excited at this point, and when he gets excited, he forgets that he's speaking German, so he's yelling his orders in German. And at uh, some point, he says... Where are my cavalry? Uh, and so I don't really know that he has directed this attack, but here's what I do know. Uh, I do know that the Confederates are in a little bit of a bind. Uh, on their, their assault has stalled uh, on their western end, um, on their left uh, flank, where you see the 62nd Virginia, and you see Woodson's Missourians in there. Um, and they they have um, they've come up uh, to the Bushong buildings, but now um, the effects of Siegel's line are having um, are, are taking their toll. And so you've got uh, Carlin's uh, West Virginia battery, you have Snow's Maryland battery, you got Von Kleesler's battery that are all pouring a, a withering fire into the left of the Confederate line, and so they are stalling. And I think what you see is you see. Uh, Stahl, uh, who's the overall uh, the federal cavalry commander, wanting to take a, advantage of that moment. Um, and what he doesn't uh, what he doesn't understand is that this isn't Europe and this isn't uh, Napoleon's battlefield, and it's just not going to work. He's going to take, um, I believe, something like fifteen hundred troopers, and they are going to launch this attack up the Valley Pike and it, and off into the fields immediately to the east of the Pike. And they're going to be bogged down in muddy, awful, awful muddy terrain. Uh, the rain has made a quagmire out of the fields. The horses are throwing their riders, getting stuck in the mud. The attack slows down just from the logistics and the, and the weather alone. And then they're riding into this vortex that you see. Uh, you've got Eccles uh, Brigade is holding a line. You see the 22nd Virginia, commanded by Colonel Patton. Uh, George Patton of World War II Spain's grandfather. Uh, and then you have the 23rd Virginia Battalion you see there near Smith's Creek, uh, commanded by Colonel Derrick. Colonel Derrick is the only West Point trained officer uh, on this battlefield. And uh, Colonel Derrick's going to put his men into guard against cavalry. They're going to form against, uh, form square on the battlefield. This is one of the only places uh, in the war that that happens. Uh, and then you have what Breckenridge um, has really done creatively, you have a, a, a battle line that's anchored with artillery. That artillery is hub uh, to shoulder with the infantry and they're holding the, the vortex of that angle. 
uh, and Breckenridge himself will wait. He'll hold the, the artillery fire uh, until Stahl's cavalry are right amongst that angle, and then he'll open up with certain death. And the famous quote of one of the federal troopers was that they were ready for us. Okay, let's uh, great summary there. So this, so Stahl's Stahl's attack repulsed, and that that pretty much knocked out the cavalry for the Union side uh, for the rest of the battle. They really did not figure much into it. Um, uh, let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, we've got some uh, images here. So this is the left flank of the final Union line. This is you can see on the right of this image. I hope. Uh, some uh, tractor trailers and vehicles. That's I-81. This is on the east side of 81, uh, the line where uh, the, and you can see on the far left, there's also a road and that's the Valley Pike. So there was a lot of significant action in here. The, the Union troops wound up calling this area the Bloody Cedars uh, because of the, the violent action in here. And if we if we are this again, this is from the left flank of the Union line, looking at the advancing Confederates. But if we go to the next slide, uh, we have a, a good view of the style charge. Uh, the Valley Pike is over on our left in this image, and if you look kind of past that uh, telephone pole, you see a tree line way in the back and some open ground in front of it. That's the Union line right there. And Stahl came from just to the right of that line. And uh, this is the area where the, where the artillery was, was, right, Kevin? That's right. These are two great images. I'm glad you have these in here because um, they are the opposite of each other. So you're actually looking uh, almost at the opposite camera angles. And so this is the Confederate vantage point. This is where those guns are sitting. Colonel Derrick's uh, battalion is going to be off to the right of this image, running off on a on a 40 degree, 45 degree angle, something like that. Uh, Colonel Patton's men are going to be running off to the left of this image on a similar angle, um, you know, probably using the stone wall uh, along the, the turnpike is some additional advantage. And in the you know the distance, and you see the trees in the distance, that was all open on the day of the battle, those trees mark the lowest of the low ground. And, and out of that, uh, it will come storming these 1500 troopers. And in that uh, field that you see in the immediate foreground, uh, it's gonna be a killing field uh, as nine or 10 artillery pieces uh, open up from this position. And then in Bowdoin, we'll open up with some horse uh, artillery with some flanking fire that's gonna come uh, from the other side of Smith's Creek and just Infillate this uh, the, the the this charge. It's it's really a horrible moment for the federal cavalry. All right, let's move toward the end of the battle here, the climactic moment. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, the uh, this is we're going to have to kind of just just uh, talk about this for about one second. <laughs> uh, but this is the area on, on the on the uh, other side of Smith's Creek from the battlefield. Uh, Imboden had big plans for flank attack on that side, but never seemed to get that off the ground. Uh, and they, they had some influence with artillery from the other side of the creek, but not much uh, here. Uh, in the next slide, what we'll see is the beginning, uh, is a map here that shows the uh, Confederate line making an advance with the VMI cadets because a gap opened in the, in the Confederate lines and really Breckenridge very reluctant to order in the, the cadets, the VMI cadets, Virginia Military Institute cadets. They did not want to use them because many of them were teenagers. Um, but really with this gap in the line and a, an advance by the 34th Massachusetts, uh, he did not really have much choice. So as we go through some photos, Kevin, I'll get you to help me interpret uh, what we're looking at here. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And um, you'll see this, this is the, uh, the right flank now of the final Union line. And um, what, what are we seeing here? The Confederate line seems to stretch on in this view and, and you've got the Bushong house. Where, where is the Confederate attack gonna come from? Well, you, your, your marks there on your image are, are really good. I mean, you're, you're, this is about the position of Carlin's West Virginia battery. This is at the, the, the highest point of the ground. This is what would be called Bushong's Hill. 
you're looking down across what was a wheat field on the day of the battle. It had been plowed and turned over uh, in some areas. Uh, this would become the famous field of lost shoes. Um, and what you see in the in the middle ground is the Bushong farmstead. It's right about the center of that uh, that that fence line, that tree line you see there, where the VMI cadets would be brought up to plug the hole in the line. Um, notice we've talked a lot about a lot of this battle, and we're just now mentioning the cadets. The cadets have been here all day long, but they've not been engaged. They've been uh, they've already taken some casualties. Uh, they've been on the battlefield the entire time, but they've been held in reserve and coming up behind the main line. Um, and now they're put in the front line and they're being chewed up uh, along the edge of the Bushong orchard. And without orders, um, they're going to uh, they're going to realize that they, they can't fall back uh, and they can't stay there. And so they're going to get up and they're going to charge across that field that you see there. Um, and they're uh, Colonel Carter's men are also going to charge. Um, some other uh, members of the line, that entire Confederate line is going to advance. It's not just the VMI cadets uh, that advances. Um, and the cadets will uh, see some of these guns on this position. So um, you're really getting a good vantage point of the, the last, I guess you could say, grand charge of this battle will happen across this, these fields that you see. Okay, let's move on then to the next slide. We have some more images of this section of the battlefield. On the left <laughs> is the uh, Bushong farm that's part of the uh, New Market Battlefield and uh, well-preserved, great place to go uh, uh, to visit. The cadets kind of went around both sides of this building before they, they moved into the tree line. And what are we looking at on the right, Kevin? I see a barn there on the right, and that tree line. Is this part of the advance? And the and and what is it? What did the what did the um, field of lost shoes? What did that mean? Well, that you're you're looking. Um, uh, first of all, you, you mentioned the VMI. Um, you know, you mentioned these these great buildings. Uh, it needs to be said that uh, VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, has long cared for this part of the battlefield, and they've been great stewards of it. I believe since the 1960s. Uh, and so the buildings you see there are part of what they take care of and that they lovingly keep open in memory of those cadets. Uh, Got to put a plug in for our good partners at VMI. Uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the picture on the right, that is a, a more close up of that field of lost shoes I was talking about. Now there is some debate. This would not have been the only field in which you lost your shoes. Um, the people would have been having their shoes sucked off by the mud, uh, sucked off the, their feet, all along here because it was just awful, awful, wet, spongy ground, excuse me. Um, but this is where the, the cadets will, they will charge uh, and, um, and really charge, not just across this field, but into uh, history. Uh, this is where they, they gain their fame that encourages cadets even today. All right, let's move on to, uh... The next image here, um, this is kind of the culminating area. It's an, it's an uh, illustration from a, a 19th or early 20th century publication. Uh, this kind of illustrates a little bit more over on the low ground you see would have been uh, where the cadets came up. But as you say, the, the entire Confederate line started to move up toward the Union position. And the, the image we saw before of the cannon, th this is directly in front of the cannon to give you a better look at the uh, at the viewpoint with Massanut Mountain there in the background. The uh, cadets were able to uh, seize one of the cannons uh, all along the line, you know, a lot of casualties. And uh, eventually the Union forces are pressed back and begin their retreat. And I believe we have uh, some images of that and a map too. Let's go to the next one if we could. So this was the route from Newmarket. And we, where, where that arrow, where the bottom arrow is, uh, Kevin, this this uh, uh, you can see the this kind of eastward bow of the Shenandoah, and then Smith's Creek on the other side of the Valley Pike, and that again is where you were talking about uh, really a bottleneck there to to uh, uh, narrow and pinch in the the uh, the Union position. Yeah, it, it really helps uh, to see it on this map. Um, it, it makes what Siegel decides to do on that battlefield, at least make a little more sense. He doesn't, he, he wants to pull his lines back to a, a location where he doesn't have as, 
uh, as wide a front to defend, and you can see that there. Um, mm-hmm. And then, th- and that's going to get smaller and smaller the further north he goes. So we see them retreating uh, past Roods Hill, which is kind of which is a, a high eminence, and there's some uh, there's some a big stretch of bottomland in there uh, that's still remarkable today. Very almost completely agricultural and beautiful spot, and they're trying to get to uh, Mount Jackson, which is the which is a kind of across the uh, branch of the Shenandoah River there. Uh, and we have, uh, we have a great image that uh, uh, your foundation was kind enough to let us use the next image, which will show us kind of this view of the bottomland. This is the Valley Pike, uh, current, you know, call, designated Route 11 now. And the Union troops uh, were, were fleeing the battlefield uh, Toward the distance, so they were, they were kind of, we're kind of looking at the Union axis of, of retreat. Um, Kevin Siegel, Siegel's retreat was, was it a was it a, a a bull run kind of route or was it an organized withdrawal? How did it go? It was probably six and one half dozen of the other. There there was a um, an attempt from from ridge to ridge to uh, to, to rally some semblance of a line. Uh, allowing other troops to escape uh, further to the to the north and and to kind of leapfrog and reverse uh, that way all the way to the crossing of the uh, the river there on the other side of uh, Mims Bottom, which is kind of what you're looking across here. Um, there's a hero um, strategically thinking, or I guess uh, tactically thinking. There's a little bit of a hero here in, in the person of. Um, DuPont. Uh, DuPont is commanding some artillery. He does not have uh, orders to move forward, um, but he will move forward to the sound of the guns. And then when he sees there's a general retreat, he's going to actually use his artillery uh, to sift with this leapfrogging. And he's going to set up his artillery on one ridge, use it to provide covering fire long enough for his uh, other sections to get set up on uh, another ridge farther to the rear, he will then use that fire to screen more of a, uh, a, 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 a retreat. And so there is a little bit of organized defense here. Um, and so it's not a total wrap. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, we, we, we have a few questions uh, uh, before we move on. Uh, I believe this is our last slide here before, uh, for the battle. Uh, for, first, before we, we go on to the questions, uh, Kevin, let me just uh, ask, what, what is the state of the battlefield now? Are there active preservation efforts to preserve even more land that's already been, uh, been saved? There are. We're, we're right now um, working to save two key VMI sites, for example. Um, we have a small parcel right on the edge of what was then the town. It's now in town itself, where the VMI cadets, uh, the cadet battery will open up and pour fire down upon the second line of the Federals. Then we are trying to preserve what's known as um, the uh, Battery Heights area, which is that area where the artillery is set up uh, opposing the, the cavalry charge. Um, and we've got um, other pieces of ground that we're trying to preserve uh, around the advance of the 62nd Virginia. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of preservation effort going on here. Uh, there's also a major effort on behalf of the Battlefields Foundation and, and some of its partners to uh, reimagine the battlefield experience here uh, so that um, what's been happening uh, so uh, well, what's been so well done at VMI for so long, uh, we can add some more ground and some more trails and access to the, the core battlefield that they've preserved uh, so that we can expand the visitor experience here. So we're investing a lot into um, uh, the interpretation here and the visitor experience. And we've just re-erected a monument on this battlefield. It was the only monument um, that uh, has been saved from Charlottesville, actually. Uh, and that monument used to sit in front of the courthouse in Charlottesville. And it's been placed on the Newmarket battlefield uh, right uh, in Wharton's line of advance. Uh, and it's having new bronzes made for it. It'll be rededicated as the Virginia monument. And it'll be uh, dedicated to all the Virginia soldiers that fought here. So there's a lot going on at Newmarket. Um, and so you need to come back and visit us, John, obviously, and then uh, also all of you who are on the, 
uh, on the on the call tonight. Uh, come see us over the next few years. You're going to keep seeing improvements. Got a question on uh, uh, Colonel Patton. Where was where was his regiment uh, primarily during this battle? Patton is is with Eccles. Uh, Eccles really isn't feeling well that day, so Patton is going to be doing double duty, commanding his regiment as well as at times during this battle, filling in for Eccles at a brigade level. He's going to be moving um, northward with the rest of the Confederate Army along the Valley Pike, and and his. Uh, his men will be moving, the 22nd Virginia will be moving right through the downtown. They actually swarm around the building that I'm sitting in now, um, and they'll move um, along the pike, anchored on the pike. As they get north of town, they will ooze slightly to the left of the pike. And by the time of that kind of high watermark of this battle, uh, just before the cavalry charge, they're forming the, the left angle of that uh, famous vortex, that famous angle that is created on the right of the Confederate line. So in general terms, when you visit here, if you follow the Valley Turnpike from south to north, you're following the advance in the general location of Patton's men. Okay, uh, last question is, uh, what were the casualties of the VMI cadets? Uh, the casualties of VMI cadets, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. There were 10 that died as a result of their wounds, either killed outright um, or um, or die were mortally wounded here, um, and I believe there's somewhere around 50 of them that that were wounded, something like that, um, which uh, is a relatively uh, high number. Uh, many of them were cared for right here in the middle of town. Um, they're not going to have a whole lot of time to rest here. They'll stay here for several days, but then they will be marched off with the rest of the army, uh, and um, and they will do a hasty burial of those cadets that uh, were killed out right here on the battlefield. Uh, and then they will be marched from here eventually into Richmond, already famous by the time they get to Richmond. Um, you know, what the cadets do uh, tactically here on the battlefield is important. Um, but I think probably their biggest impact that they have as a result of this battle didn't happen on the battlefield, but happened in the hearts and minds of the Southern people. Uh, mm -hmm. They were a, a major... Uh, boost to morale. And like I said, by the time they get to Richmond from Newmarket, um, they are already being received as heroes. Thanks to Kevin of the uh, Shenandoah, Shenandoah Battlefields Foundation, uh, Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation, for everything, for bringing me around my, and bringing Charlie around too, uh, uh, providing illustrations and maps and, and <clears throat> images too. Uh, your expertise, obviously, tonight. So we appreciate you being with us. John, thank you. You're a great friend. You're a great historian. And uh, you do great things for our battlefields. Can't thank you enough for doing these programs. Can't thank the U.S. Army enough for having us. And uh, I really appreciate being your guest. Well, thanks very much. Okay, Kevin, we'll catch you down the line. And thank you again, uh, folks. We uh, want to thank the audience for uh, participating in our program. Uh, glad to have you with us, as always. And uh, our producer, Kenna, thank you as well. And with that, we'll say good night and see you at another program. Good night.